Hello, I'm Stuart Hi. Clifton, and uh, today is July 29th, 2021. I'm here with Alan Ramser, who I'll be interviewing as part of the National Bar Association's Oral History Project. Alan, I've been looking forward to this. I'm honored to be interviewing you, and I'll try not to embarrass you. Okay. I'll try not to embarrass myself. <laughs> I know that we mostly want to talk about your career as an attorney, uh, but before we get to that, let's hear a little bit about um, how you came to the state, how you came to the profession and to, to Nashville. Um, and so in a, let's just start bef well before you decided even to become a lawyer. Uh -huh. So, Alan Ramser, the early years, you're on. G give, us the, give us the details. Well, I was, uh, I was born in uh, eastern uh, North Carolina. I uh, moved to Jackson, Tennessee when my father was transferred in 1963. Uh, and so I, I grew up, went to uh, middle school and high school in Jackson, and then went to uh, Lambeth College in Jackson. Um, uh, married uh, Jimmy Lynn. Brewer at the time, mm -hmm. um, and she and I um, went to law school together. Just actually sat next to each other um, and shared books. Um, I've often said that if something was uh, came out blue, it meant that the green and the yellow highlighters had merged, and that meant that was the important stuff. <laughs> so. Or maybe you were just too close together. Nah, no, no. Okay, we'll leave that alone. How about that? So. Um, that's how I got to Tennessee, and uh, uh, after law school, um, uh, came to Nashville uh, to practice. Well, let's go back a little bit. Um, what? When did you first meet Jimmy Lynn? Was that before college, before Lamb? I'm, uh, so both Jimmy Lynn and I went to the same high school okay. uh, in Jackson. Uh, we each dated either uh, other people, and the high school we went to had more than 400. Um, students in the class, so uh, mm. she was actually a year um, ahead of me. I've been trained to say ahead, not older. Uh, she was a year ahead of me <laughs> <laughs> at uh, Jackson High School. So um, I knew her. Uh, she was dating somebody else, and uh, she went to Lambeth uh, first, and then um, I followed and went to Lambeth. Uh, broke up with my longtime girlfriend, and uh, she and I began a very platonic um, intellectual relationship to begin with. We really? debated all sorts of political stuff and the like before we even thought about romance. So. How about that? Well, I never heard that story. Um, now, the other part of it that uh, we've had people call in and say, please ask Alan this, you know, because they just don't know the answer. You know, <laughs> what is it like to be married to a lawyer, particularly one who was clearly smarter than you? <laughs> You got a good answer it's for that? A, it, it's, it's great to be married to, uh, to Jimmy Lynn. Ah, I, oh, I know good. I can't speak objectively about any, uh, any or, or uh, actually my answer I'm sure is subjective. I can't speak <laughs> with any experience about any, anybody else, but it's great to be married to Jimmy Lynn. Uh, we, um, we understand each other. We get, when, when each of us has, um, has trials and tribulations, yeah. have had trials and tribulations in our practice or in uh, career or otherwise, We've understood each other. We've understood what each other were, were going through. And that makes a big difference to have a partner that, uh, with you all the time. That, uh, that And I know from that. knowing both of you a little, you know, for a long time that you never actually worked in the same office, but you had some common interests. We were close. Yeah. We, were, we were down the hall each other. When, I, when she, she was at, uh, at the Legal Aid Society, then Legal Services of Nashville, um, mm -hmm. we were down the hall from each other. We could and did ride together because we only had one car. Oh, that's uh, right. She was still there when you she were. She was still Tals. there when I started the Tennessee Association of Legal Services and Legal Aid Projects. So, uh, tail slap. Tail slap. Yeah. Oh yeah, tail slap. Yes. A mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. They got rid of that. I mean, not the agency, yeah, not right the organization. Right. Well, I just had to ask that early on. Um, I also know from knowing you for several years that 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 we share some other things in common besides bar committees and activities. Be married to strong women. Strong women, uh, married well, um, including, though, that we were the first in our families to become yes. lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your decision or gradual realization that that was going to be yeah. your career. Um, and what were the um, early influencers on you and your career path? 
sure. about becoming an attorney? So um, I, uh, I was in political science when I went to, to Lambeth. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of paths you can take as with a political science and history kind of background. Uh, one is, um, uh, is to get involved in, in actual political work, um, campaign work. Another is to teach. Um, and then the, the third one, if you're so inclined, is to uh, is, is, uh, is law school. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was inclined not to do the first two, and that left <laughs> law school as the choice. Um, I, I guess I always enjoyed advocacy, too, so that was the, the other piece of that. Yeah. Um, early on, I had decided on, on political science because I had a really influential um, geography professor in high school who mm. uh, steered me to, uh, uh, who, who, who sort of created some passion for political geography and that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's how, sort of what got me there. Okay. Um, so that, that's what got you thinking about political science and then ultimately political science law. And then, and, then law and, then, and then law school. When did you know you were going to go to law school? When I got admitted. I mean, when did you know you, <laughs> when did you, know you wanted to go to law school? I, you know, probably sometime our senior year. I mean, again, Jimmy Lynn, so Jimmy Lynn and I were married when we were still in undergraduate school. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, uh, she was a, uh, about to become, a, she was a rising senior, and I was uh, a rising junior. So um, we sort of made that decision together. She, yeah. <laughs> she went to work um, and uh, uh, supported us um, for, uh, you know, for a year. Right. Uh, I, I graduated a semester early. Um, so that uh, we could we could have a little bit of money when we went off to Lawson. Yeah. So she stayed around Jackson for an, a year and wor yeah. worked, yeah. waiting on you to catch up with her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I never have. You, <laughs> then you moved to Knoxville, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I did. I have heard that there's a law school in Knoxville. And there is a very fine law school. Tell us about that National school. Right. <laughs> well. Um, UT and, was, and you, you and that school, and what what it meant to you, and what who who sure. meant something to you. U, UT was 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 um, going through like many law schools in the early to mid seventies, going through the throes of enormous change. Um, the profession had decided had realized that there were um, too few women, and rather than just saying well, we're going to take this class and cut it in half and get half the slots to men and half the slots to women they decided we'll expand the law school classes. And so the school was growing leaps and bounds, had lots of um, young professors um, oh. coming in. And, um, and so it, there was a lot of change going on uh, at, the, at the school when, when we arrived there. Um, UT had had, ha, has, has, still has, I think, the oldest um, continually operating legal clinic um, among the ABA accredited schools, and so that was always that ha it always had that practice element. Right, to it. right. That's yeah. been that's a really interesting point. I don't remember when it was started, but it was well before any other law school anywhere around so here had Professor a Professor Miller came from from Duke, and he was the one that uh, decided that some sort of practice uh, element was necessary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, beyond. Uh, First couple of years, uh, Jimmy Lynn and I both worked our way th worked through law school. We were, um, uh, we were, uh, what were we? Student assistants or something like that in the yeah. in a program that Grayford Gray ran. And then, um, as we went into the upper level courses, after we got beyond the sort of, you know, contracts and torts and con law and that sort of stuff, in the in the second uh, and going middle of the second year. Going into the third year, the seminars were much more interesting to me, uh, and the opportunity to sort of think a little bit more broadly about what we were doing. Um, uh, and then I um, I uh, uh, learned about and fell into a program that Grayford Gray was running through the Public Law Institute, mm -hmm. which is a legislative internship program for law students. Um, and what we were doing was something very different from most uh, 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 internship programs, as sure you and I know from being around the legislature, almost all the lawmakers have some sort of intern, paid or unpaid. It may come from the, the local uh, college or university, or uh, it may be uh, just somebody uh, who's uh, who's uh, willing to go and go to work for free for uh, to, for the learning experience. Mm -hmm. Our program was different. We were associated with the legislative legal services office, which is the drafting and counsel office for the legislature. Right. 
And so we went there, drafted legislation, drafted bills and resolutions, and um, reported floor, service, uh, floor action. Um, there was no, uh, there was a, a, a state, state service uh, through legislative legal services that produced an, a daily sort of synopsis of what had happened on the floor. And uh, we stood in the well of the house and reported the action and uh, turned in our papers and it was typed overnight and mm -hmm. put on a, I think a mimeograph machine <laughs> and produced um, for the next morning. You know, it's worth mentioning for folks who might not know that uh, the state has come a long way in that regard. Indeed. Uh, what, whatever people might think about our legislature uh, and our state government, we routinely get awards, national awards, for having the best uh, and most open process in the sense of simultane simultaneous uh, video, videos available, uh, save them forever and all of that. And that hasn't always been the case mm -hmm. anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a, that's been something that developed. So you were the record in some ways. That's right. That's right. Uh, it wasn't all this technology now. <laughs> committee action was not was not reported in the same way. Um, yeah. You really had to rely on friends and and enemies um, <laughs> to, uh, to to find out what was yeah. happening in other committees if you weren't in that committee. Wow, uh, that's, we, we, I'd forgotten. Uh, so it was a very uh, a very much more uh, sort of uh, helter-skelter kind of process. Uh, okay. They still haven't fixed, though, have they, Stuart, the uh, amendment process. There still is the possibility of the surprise amendment um, in committee or otherwise. You, there's no requirement that they be introduced in advance or uh, that, you even, that you have any, uh, any opportunity to know about them with, when they're introduced on the floor or anything like that. You can't well, some them, committee can't chairs will not let them be introduced unless they're okay. filed beforehand. Okay. Uh, I don't know that that's a universal does that politically. Rule. Does that make them publicly available? File with the committee is not the same as no. It doesn't available. make them that. Yeah, okay, it that's the. That. There, there is a, there is still an element of surprise in the process, and particularly with subcommittees, we've sure. made some progress on that, uh, where subcommittee amendments are posted now. Big surprise. It's only happened the last couple of years, but that. Uh, my point is still true that for its time uh, sure. now. Compared sure. to then, I mean, we've, we're just light years sure. away from that, and and many other states. Sure. So there still it still is some view, and I'll use a big word on you, opacity for the process being opacity. opaque, yeah. um, as opposed to transparent, um, and and that they 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 take every advantage of that. Process. We'll have no <laughs> cynicism process. here. Okay. No okay. cynicism okay. here. Okay. No, I'm just kidding, probably. <laughs> so anyway, you're you're working here for credit hours. Is that what it was? I mean, you were a law student. No, we were working for pay. For pay. A little bit of pay. And you're still in law school, but yeah, working yeah. for pay. Wow. The state provided us with the vehicle that we drove down here. Um, okay. We had we spent most of our pay um, on four, an apartment four up in an attic on Blair Avenue, <laughs> Blair Boulevard, that we uh, in the in the attic there that we were, where we rented uh, the four of us rented, rented yeah. you know a cal. Uh, a, 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 a mattress on the floor. Yes, indeed. Uh, in, individual mattresses. Uh, I mean, a block from where I live. I yeah, think, absolutely. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, we, uh, at the time, we generally sub subsisted on um, uh, uh, visiting legislative receptions every evening <laughs> to eat. <laughs> we were invited to all the legislative receptions, and we would go and just pile up our plates. And that's we didn't have anywhere uh, any any. Any way to fix dinner, so <laughs> that's that's, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So I take it, given your future career, you you kind of liked this experience. I was I was greatly taken with the process, mm -hmm. uh, taken with the prospect of being able to be part of that process. I've never asked you this. Uh, we've known each other a long time, but I've never asked you this. Did you meet some legislators that you had developed a relationship with? At that time, uh, to I did. that, that I became did. you became closer to actually yeah. when you got out of law yeah, school. Yeah, there were several. There were several uh, young uh, young law, law, young lawmakers who who saw the um, the value of having uh, law students that yeah. they could call on to do research or uh, to or, or to help them mm -hmm. develop legislation was a little more um, uh, a little more well thought out. So yeah, we did we did meet up with people that way. What do you have a specific memory that stands out from that time period that year? Was it a year? It was a session. One, a two-year session. Quarter. Yeah. One, one, no, one quarter. One quarter. One quarter. Okay. So it, uh, one 
half half a session or a yeah. one legislative yeah. you know January to May yeah uh, uh, it, UT at the time was on quarters and so we took a quarter that quarter uh, and then we made up the classwork yeah um, by um, going to summers summer right. quarter do you remember uh, but yeah, any, yeah there is there anything? is one experience there that stands out to me and it was uh, it was uh, sort of my first brush with uh, with, a, with an ethics issue um, um, we had again we were drafting bills and resolutions and I had a, a senator a state senator come to me um, uh, he knew that I had drafted uh, the, uh, the resolution that um, uh, uh, that uh, he was interested in and um, he asked me, uh, and he found seen the resolution, but didn't obviously didn't know who had drafted it. So he came to me and asked me who who I drafted it for. And um, I had had a little bit of ethics um, <laughs> in, in law school. I don't think I'd, we'd actually had the course, but we'd had a little introduction to ethics. And Gray for Gray had always been careful to counsel us that. And one of the things we were learning, obviously, at the Legislative Legal Services pro uh, uh, Office was sort of how this practice of law goes. And um, I said, I don't think I can give that to you, Senator. Um, that's a, that's a confidential, maybe even a, maybe even a privileged uh, matter, but certainly a confidential matter. And he pressed me. Because it hasn't been filed yet. Right, right, right. right. And he, he could find out who it had been drafted for once it had been, yeah. once it had been filed if the person ever filed it. Right. Um, maybe, but maybe not. I mean, the process at that time was it, you, the, legis the resolution went back to the sponsor or, or the person who asked for it, but they could hand it off to anybody else. So right. it could have been drafted for somebody else and then somebody right. else introduced so it. You so just turned and it would have remained, remained confidential. So process. here you are, this pipsqueak law student turning mm -hmm. down a state senator. A state senator who was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, he, you know, pressed me at least once and I said, so I, I can't do it. I, I, I believe our, uh, my professional <laughs> ethic. Well, they don't apply to you. Well, so because we, you were a student, he decided that. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. So we went up <laughs> to see Jim Clodfelter, who was the director of legislative legal services. He went too. Yeah. Oh yeah. He went too I'm to saying, make his case. Yeah. Okay. To make his case, and Clodfelter just quickly said, "No, okay. he, he's he's right." That, Confidentiality applies here, so and you, you can't get it. you were essentially a troublemaker at the legislature. Oh, yeah, legislature yeah. for yeah. the very beginning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it. That's fascinating. So that year, that that session, that mm -hmm. January through May or whatever, well, was enough to really whet your appetite. That's right. That's um, right. You're already in law school. What do you do with a law degree? A lot of things, but mm, people like you and me would automatically be quite interested in that part of the law, I would guess. This opportunity to do what uh, I later learned people called policy advocacy, to do uh, work on policy as opposed to individual advocacy. Right. That would, yeah. yeah. Did you consider yourself sort of an idealist at this point? Um, oh, yeah. Not in oh, the, yeah. I don't think that's bad, of course. Yes. I just mean you, you wanted to do something that would make a difference. Um, yeah. You know, there's there was often a debate in our household, um, going back to being married to a lawyer. Um, Jimmy Lynn was um, a legal aid lawyer doing individual cases, and you know, winning on behalf of individuals who had individual problems, and where, where there was a generally a, a clear result, perhaps not always a clear result, as you know from being an individual legal aid lawyer. Right. Um, and. Uh, she and I would discuss about sort of so, but, but my work when I became a, a legal aid lobbyist was, uh, you know, it was win big or lose big, right? <laughs> so, you knew when you had won, you knew when you had lost, right. Um, right. Um, and um, you, there was a big opportunity near the end of the session to know whether how, what the score was going to be. Uh, so we would talk about it um, in, in those terms and say which of us is doing better, and you know we could debate it every night if we wanted to. But, <laughs> but for uh, for sake of harmony, we didn't always debate it. But that was always in the background, uh, doing individual justice or doing sort of societal justice. That would affect the whole state, mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, whole class of people. Yeah, yeah, a traditional dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So that was that your third year in law school or second? 
I guess um, I was going into my third year. Uh, yeah, that was it. I was going into my third year. So was that your only real legislative experience? Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything your third year like that? Well, you know, again, we had some seminars. Um, right. We had specifically had an environmental law seminar that where one of the professors who was involved in the, uh, two of the professors actually involved in the snail darter case and the other um, environmental impact cases. Um, in, oh, yeah. Huh. Um, in East Tennessee. I taught that course. Um, and mm -hmm. one of them, uh, Gorham got fired up at UT. He was not tenured, and TVA put a lot of pressure on the law school. Over the snail darter case. Over the snail darter case. Because it, it blocked a significant dam and a significant um, yeah. recreational project um, in East Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. So um, what else do you re think is worth sharing with folks about that, that had some bearing on your future work um, from law school? I mean, obviously a lot of things. <laughs> we, uh, we were picking up things that we used even when we didn't know we ever would. Uh, but that was your only real legislative experience. What what else can you share? What what were your favorite classes and professors, yeah. and why? Um, well, again, uh, so I was particularly um, taken with, with with ethics. Actually, um, most people saw it. At, you know, we're, this is in the for some people they'll recognize this is in the post Watergate era. Uh, of, you know, law school, where law schools discovered. That they had to teach ethics, uh, that it wasn't just something that people <laughs> and that lawyers learned, right, <laughs> and right. that they had to teach it and and teach it in a way. At uh, least the way we learned it was not just say, here's a set of rules and here's the edge of the rule that you can go to. But what are you aspiring to? What are you trying to get to? These are actually in the in the olden days of the ethical considerations and disciplinary rules as opposed to the rules of professional conduct. Oh, yeah. So. Um, we, you know, that the, our, the approach that was taken by the law professors and the like was that sort of aspirational sort of what should you be doing as opposed to what you can get away with. Um, and get away with is, okay. is, I'm afraid, something that's sort of happened to us uh, over the years. It's all rule-based. It's all, are you on this line, this side of the line, or that side of the line? That's what people want to learn, not what's, what's, what's best. Uh, yeah. Well, lawyers have a... <clears throat> In many ways, a, a natural tendency to want to have clear-cut answers on some of this, yeah, uh, and you know, m go on to something else. Okay, so even if they want them, they don't get them. <laughs> right, <laughs> they get that. And well, and more important than lawyers, their clients want clear-cut answers. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, much of what has happened, much of what is happening, I think, is the client pushing for an answer, as opposed to lawyers. Uh, I had one uh, Nashville Bar president tell me early in my career at, at the Nashville Bar that he really would relish the, the role of being a counselor to his clients, to tell his clients when they were, uh, what was the best solution here, mm -hmm. not what the law allowed him to do. Mm -hmm. And that um, he saw his, himself as, as, as having responsibility to them and to the profession and uh, really to society to um, to counsel that doesn't mean he has to, the client has to follow it, yeah. but at least to give yeah. them that uh, those, those options. Well, we don't have you out of law school yet. We better, yeah. we okay. better move ahead here. Okay. Uh, unless the, I mean, I take it That's you you about. had a good relationship with Reverend Gray and yeah, yeah. and remember yeah. him fondly. Any other professors? Well, Carl Pierce, um, although he gave me my worst lit, uh, grade ever in law school. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that happened to me. That happened to me. <laughs> Um, uh, okay. I'm trying to think of anybody else. So then, um, you, you both graduated, of course. Yes, same, we did. Same year. We did. Now, tell us about what happened then. Um, well, so um, so Jimmy Lynn was the first to get the jo get a job. Um, she was hired to go work for legal aid. She had been involved in the in the clinic practice um, and was very much. Um, uh, taken with um, going to try cases. That's yeah. what she wanted to do. Having real clients. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, of course, working together at the right, time. To right, self disclosure, right. she and but I worked she, together. But you know, she had taken the criminal clinic in particular. Uh, uh, but legal aid was the, the the place that was hiring. It was expansion. These were expansion years for legal aid, so they were hiring. And she was actually first hired to work in the Murfreesboro office. 
Um, and um, then um, an opening came in the Nashville office, and she took the advantage of that and went to work and uh, came to work in the Nashville office. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, a, a, again, trailing her. She was the leader, um, <laughs> trailing her, and got a job at the mental health department, Grayford Gray, um, again, my so, sort of probably my strongest mentor in law school. Um, had been counsel at the mental health department. Right. Uh, right. Mental health was going through um, lots of change at the time. Uh, there had been uh, lawsuits bought, brought by our friend, good friend Walter Kurtz and I remember him. and Gordon Bonnyman um, to to try to deinstitutionalize, to try to change some of the rules dealing with Milton C. Mental Health Institute and the general administration of the mental health system in Tennessee. And uh, you know the, the department was reacting to this, so there was a need for um, a need for lawyers, um, and they created a third a third slot in that uh, in the in the office, a legal counsel slot. And uh, I was uh, I was young enough and willing to work for little enough um, that they could hire me. So right. I went to work there. I remember getting my, my uh, so when I went to work there, I had to go work as a legal legal cl law clerk, uh, legal clerk because I wasn't licensed yet yeah uh, and so i remember getting a having a, a real party with my raise when i got the raise to ten thousand dollars a year <laughs> which was about what jimmy lynn was making mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. year as yeah. i recall yes. since i was there yes. at that point okay so we've got you in nashville with the job mm -hmm. with a reputable department of state government and Generally. close to what you had got grown mm -hmm. interested in in law school. Um, before we go any further, were you were you actually involved in political work um, <laughs> growing up and through through college? Yeah, yeah I had been um, I had been a, a McGovern delegate to the state convention. Ah, uh, yes, I remember uh, that. Now you told me that. <laughs> and um, actually, the summer that I. Now that's to the state convention. Not, yes, the not state the, convention, not the, that, well, not the national convention. Um, that summer uh, that I worked uh, between law school, between the undergraduate and law school, I was it's actually nine months I finished. But um, I was approached by three or four different um, campaigns. There was a heavy um, um, a gubernatorial race going, and they were looking for uh, for uh, for young folks to work for nothing uh, for next to nothing. Um, and I just I that I had fundamentally decided that you know just being a political animal was not what I wanted. I needed some more policy there. I needed some more, something more than just doing campaign work. So I, right. I turned those down. But there was some phenomenal money floating around. I mean, uh, you know, I talked about that ten thousand. I could have worked that summer for ten thousand dollars for three or four months. Um, so was, that was like seventy eight. The seventy eight gubernatorial. Workers. No, this is seventy four. No, I'm that far behind. Yeah. 74. What did, okay, so this is before law school. Yeah, yeah, before law school. Okay. Okay. So, so I could have, so, gotcha. so, yeah. I, so, so, yeah, I had done some, and I was, a, I had, one of the reasons I was being approached is I was president of the Madison County Young Democrats. So, <laughs> uh, so I had that on my record. Um, still have it on my record if, if anybody needs to look me up. You've so, got a record. I've Absolutely. got a record. Yeah. Um, okay, so you were always somewhat interested. I always had some interest. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, but just enough. Just enough to make sure that my candidates were getting attention and the like. It was, you know, I, again, I, it was, it was always in the background. Yeah. All right. So I guess now. Um, so at the mental yeah. health department, right. we were counseling. Was. Uh, we counseled the leadership of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, department, uh, the commissioner, the assistant commissioners on what they could do and couldn't do. We dealt with contract issues. We reviewed, um, you know. Uh, policies. We dealt with issues as they came up in the in the in the, uh, it, the individual um, institutions. Each had um, had counsel of their own um, that did commitment hearings and dealt with institu institutional specific issues. But we would handle those things. And I was specifically assigned to do the rule writing. Um, the, actually, the Uniform Administrative Procedures Act was not that old uh, then. And uh, I was assigned to learn all about the Administrative Procedures Act and, and uh, then become the specialist in how that process worked and what we needed to adopt rules on and what we didn't have to adopt rules on um, and figure that out. And then um, because of that interest in policy, 
I was also um, assigned to the to do the be the legislative liaison. Um, still call them still call them that a legislative liaison from the department to the legislature. Okay, so from the beginning, part of that job was related was to the, was mm -hmm. legislative uh, on behalf of the department. Mm -hmm. um, they call it li liaison, but it, as you and I know, the the biggest lobbying force in the state is the state. <laughs> right. So you were part of the executive branch. Yep. yep. Lobbying the legislative branch, mm -hmm. basically. Okay. All right. How long did that go on? Uh, you I was there two and a half years. Any particular case that you want to highlight that we haven't mentioned? In that case, but bill or, or event that happened while, while working yeah. with Mill Yeah, so I was assigned to do to write the rules for um, uh, uh, for um, uh, patient bill of rights and um, went across the state, held hearings, followed the UAPA, <laughs> filed the rules, and um, then um, and they went into effect. And uh, then about three months later, they were having a, uh, a, a superintendent's meeting. The commissioner held meetings about quarterly with the superintendents to talk about policy and what's Superintendents going on from each institution. From each of the mental, mental health and mental retardation uh, Which we used to have a lot more of. <laughs> yes. That's true. Yes. Um, so, um, so I was invited to the, to, the, to the meeting. It was a big deal. I was not, you know, I'm prepared. Transparencies to go on the overhead projector um, and, uh, and everything and went out to to explain the rules and what they had to do. And it was, you know, some th things were as simple as they have the right to use the telephone. Um, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, they have to, they didn't have the right to be on it all the time, but they had a right to use the telephone to contact people on the outside. They had the right to talk to their lawyer. They had the right to, you know, um, to, uh, to exercise. And I mean, it was just some basic fundamental, fundamental human rights as I saw it. And these were all based on national standards. So I got up, explained them all, and then uh, one of the superintendents said, leaned back and said, what bill of rights? <laughs> now, they'd been in effect for some, some period of time already, um, <laughs> and uh, he had not even, would not even acknowledge that they were there. So that was sort of the thing that um, convinced me that maybe I was using my talents to, um, to do um, uh, really great work, but perhaps it was not getting the attention uh, or the support that it uh, that it that it deserved. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, you know, being uh, uh, being married to a legal aid lawyer and hanging around with more with legal aid lawyers than with uh, you know doctors and psychologists in the department. The legal um, aid lawyers are always more fun. I'm guessing. Oh yeah, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and and being a, and being around the legislature and being around some uh, you know particular lawmakers who were friends of, of of the mental health department every every department over there has their patrons uh, people who watch them and, 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 and look out for their interests and and the like in, in the legislature hanging around with them I, I was observing what legal aid was able to do with their legislative program and suggested that uh, and they were doing it with a contract lobbyist um, who uh, could only spend part time on those issues and only spent part time during the session, uh, basically just available for legislative session work, right. and was not out there helping to build uh, the uh, policy base of having a group of lawyers that's thinking about what the law, law, law ought to be, right. thinking about the, what the policy ought to be and how to change it. And so um, I put together a proposal, went to uh, the uh, director of the legal service, again, still legal services in Nashville, um, Ashley Wiltshire, and said, here's my proposal. He took it to the, to a group of lawyers that, that uh, a group of directors that got together on a regular basis, a Tennessee Assi uh, Association of Legal Services and Legal Aid Projects, the famous, infamous Tau slap again. And, um, and um, they said, well, let's give it a try. Let's give it a go. So in... January, I think it was, of, of 1980, um, as the session was starting, I was hired to be the, I don't remember, the legislative council, or legislative or coordinator, or coordinator, something, or something like that, of of the uh, of Tennessee uh, to the, of what is now Taos. And we should probably mention at this point that that was perfectly legal at the time, uh, and it is not so much now. Uh, there actually are federal regulations now about outright lobbying. Uh, particularly with LSC funds, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is a big part of what, what legal aid programs and, and TALS did at that time. That's right. Very successful, as I recall. <laughs> uh, so no, and, and no small part due to your efforts. It's for, it was it was very very successful, but so that so I came to work in January of 1980. Okay, and, yeah. and yeah. within within the week that I was hired, uh, President Ronald Reagan ad- announced that he was going to abolish legal services. Right. <laughs> Zero it out. Zero period. it out. Right. Zero. No money. Um, and. There weren't going to be any um, legal aid lawyers around anymore. Of course, the legal aid had been a program of the Great Society and uh, um, out of the Office of Economic Opportunity. So it had a strong backbone, a strong, uh, a strong system going. So in addition to my lobbying activities, I was assigned to be the, um, to do, help to coordinate and to um, follow up on the um, relationship that we had with the bar. Um, unlike many of the other agencies, and many of them went away. Many that Ronald Reagan was going after, not just the Tennessee, not just legal services, but many many other OEO agencies. And unlike the, many of those other agencies, the legal aid had the bar, had bar had lawyers who cared about what they were doing. It, this was not just some social program. Um, it was a, a way for um, uh, for society to deal with the legal needs of, of clients, and the bar saw that as, a, as an important uh, an important need in the system. And so our li- relationship with the bar, legal aid's relationship with the bar, be- was something that became important at the national level with the ABA and in Tennessee with the TBA. Right. right. So I um, put on my three-piece suit. <laughs> I was one of the few legal aid lawyers who had a three-piece suit and a white shank. And I uh, got involved in the Tennessee uh, Bar Association Young Lawyers Division, just uh, to, to observe from that position, to get to know uh, the young leaders of the bar and to, to figure out how that was going to go on. Right. Um, uh, ended up getting elected as the president of the young lawyers of the uh, Tennessee Bar, and uh, that gave me a slot on the board of the Tennessee Bar Association. So I got to know the leadership of the bar. The year I was president, Woody Sims of Bass Bearing Sims was the president of the Tennessee Bar Association. And I got to know Woody very well. So we began to cement that relationship and it, to get a better understanding uh, among, within the bar about the importance of legal aid, but also legal aid understanding what the bar's needs were. So uh, that liaison and that, uh, that relationship was another part of my work that I did sort of off season when, uh, when I wasn't lobbying. Right, okay. Yes, um, and at some point during that time period, maybe you've already gotten to this point, you became the executive director yeah. of the Tennessee mm-hmm. Alliance, now, now the Tennessee Alliance mm-hmm. Legal Services, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and served for several years. I did. Okay. I think maybe five, four or five, something like that. I was there seven years, I think. Right. And what do you think of as your, your accomplishments there? Uh, well, so for, for, yeah, first there was that, that, uh, that uh, one of the first ones is that relationship with the bar, which continues to right. be a good, right. strong relationship with the bar. Um, in the uh, uh, building a strong, uh, a strong base at Taos and uh, sort of a, in those early years, we were very much just a creature of the local programs and right. uh, developing a little bit of an independent voice from those, those programs. Mm-hmm. Um, we had we ended up having um, you know clients that were not just clients of the local programs but clients of our own um, and um, built uh, through the relationship with the lawyers at the lo- local programs not just the executive directors but through the lawyers at those programs built a core of, of specialists uh, through the still called task forces, I guess, right. committees right. Um, to, uh, to study issues. And they're, and so there was very strong now, actually. Yeah, yeah. Still fairly yeah. strong. So building that backbone um, was another piece of it. And then, of course, the legislative work I was able to, uh, to, to get involved in and stay involved in. We, you know, we had a big fight with uh, um, Governor uh, Alexander over his pro- over and uh, Louis Donaldson as commissioner over his idea to cut medic. Medicaid still was Medicaid at the time to cut mm-hmm. Medicaid, and had a big battle, um, big battle over that when I was there. We um, <laughs> we uh, 
one of the things I have always tried to do is, is, and I think it's now identified in the lobbying world as sort of a jujitsu move when doing legislative work. And so we, um, we found that there was a big problem with the uh, standard of need in Tennessee, that the uh, 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 welfare program uh, and its judgment about when somebody was, would qualify had long since divorced itself from any rational view as to what was needed by, 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 the, uh, by uh, potential clients and um, was just paying some percentage of some phony number because that's all they wanted to pay. Um, got that issue, that issue got some attention from the Tennessean, which was very important to the, the, uh, the effort. And we labeled the program the AFDC Right to Work Law. Now, of course, right to work has a, is, a, is a label that uh, Republicans could not, uh, could not say no to. <laughs> um, any, how could they be of, of opposed to anything that was the right to work, right? Right. And what this did was give us an opportunity to talk about that people ought to be able to earn some money, have some resources, um, and still receive the money from the basic legal aid, uh, welfare program, but also, importantly, uh, to qualify for Medicaid. Which so, was linked to being on that which, program. Right, right. right. And, and yeah. that, so that was an important link to, uh, to their uh, Medicaid. So we were able, I mean, with, again, with the strong assistance of Joel Kaplan uh, at the Tennessean uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 get, to get that passed. Right. And then the final one that you probably had more to do with than I did because you were much more rational about it was the school breakfast program. <laughs> um, school breakfast. Uh, Tennessee had had very few counties if uh, that were involved in the school breakfast program. School lunch um, was pretty much there because the people were having lunch, and there was always that um, yeah, um, expectation that expectation that people were having lunch, and there would be it would be subsidized. But the breakfast program was 100% federally funded. Um, uh, they paid for the meals. In fact, I think they paid for the supervision and some of the other I think so. some of the other I costs so. of the program. Right. And we tried, I don't remember how many years, four or five, uh, to get to mandate that the local schools provide school breakfast. Um, um, we tried every way we knew. There was at least one state representative who um, who was very much involved with his school board and very much probably the patron of the school board locally because that was where all the jobs were. Um, at, 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 you know, who, who was very influential in, in financial matters. He would knock it down at the end of every session. Right. Um, and, and finally, um, with some, uh, some, a, a brilliant legislative tactician, um, and lawmaker, I came up with an idea, uh, that, uh, that ultimately passed, uh, that the local agencies, the local school boards would have to have a hearing every year. Um, to discuss whether to have school breakfast or not. And that gave the local um, hunger agencies and the like an opportunity to be advocates uh, for, uh, for the school breakfast program it, in a way that it was, really wasn't. It became a local yeah. option yeah. Um, yeah. that each school system could choose not to offer this free mm -hmm. service that didn't cost mm -hmm. state dollars, mm -hmm. uh, but they had to have an open hearing about mm -hmm. it. And they just didn't want to do that. Yeah. So they all offered it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember all that. Huh. Well, we should pick up this pace a little so bit. So lots of kids get breakfast. Exactly. More, that, probably right? more, more per, um, percentage-wise, more children in Tennessee get school it, breakfast than it was, anywhere. It was my experience with that, though, that I, where I came to realize, Stuart, that I, was, I was, uh, was burning out at legal aid, and I was burning out because I'd gotten too close to the issues. I'd go home at the end of the session when we couldn't pass the school breakfast program and I would literally cry yeah. um, because I had, I had failed my, because of my efforts. I had failed 300,000 school kids who weren't going to get breakfast. And you know, that, that, that was a pretty heavy, heavy load to carry. And it, it um, meant that I didn't have the social distance or the professional distance from the issue to be able to back up and see uh, what you and others saw in the opportunity to have um, ha have a different way of approaching this from just simply mandating it. Uh, You're saying you cared more than I did. No. Well, no. <laughs> no. I'm just teasing. I didn't have a good way to, to process it. Yeah, so, yeah. And, you know, it, that look, that is a, a trait that people don't like about lawyers, 
but it is one of the ways that we can, people ask, so how can you be a lawyer? Well, you take on, what do you do? You take on other people's problems. And if you take them on too personally, you're no good. You, 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 you can't see, you can't see the, the way out of it. If they could figure it out, they'd probably figure it out themselves to do it. Um, but, you know, that's our, our job is to figure out with some professional distance what's the way to get it to the job done. Right. Okay. So you essentially, and there came a time where you had an opportunity to move on to something else. After yeah. several years at the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services, yeah. Yeah. So I left some as director and some as a staff yeah. attorney. I left, uh, left legal aid to work for in a congressional campaign, right. and um, it was not successful. And then uh, the Nashville Bar job came open. The Nashville Bar decided they were going to hire their first executive director because, importantly, uh, the state had adopted a CLE program, and they wanted to be providing CLE to, as a service to their members. Right. So they th decided that they probably needed a lawyer to do that, and um, you know I was available, so, so you just, <laughs> they hired me. <laughs> and thus began a several-year tenure. 32 years as a bar exec. Yeah. And how many of those with the NBA? 13 years at the National, National Bar. Mm -hmm. What do you think of as some of the key accomplishments at the NBA? Well, the first was building that CLE program. There was nothing. Um, there had been some occasional lunch and learn programs. And really there weren't um, many anywhere in the state. That's right. It that's wasn't right. just that Nashville had fallen down on the job. It just wasn't a big part of what groups could do sure. because there wasn't a big and, and it wouldn't surprise you that when they hired the first uh, director for the CLE program, I immediately went to him and started asking questions about what the rules were. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what does this mean? What does that mean? That sort of thing. And so... Uh, I got involved in, in, in advocacy on what the rules ought to be and how they ought to be written with yeah. Dave Sharon and others. So um, so that was one. You, you had to usher in the whole era for the NBA. For, for the NBA to have, have that. The, the NBA had, had taken positions on legislation, in particular legislation that had, um, had an impact on national judgeships yeah. uh, and the like. But because we're in Nashville, that Nashville Bar had actually put, taken positions and occasionally had put people um, 